Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh God. You are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. I, I love the story of Jonah. And this morning we're not going to have a, uh, a scripture reading, but, but you're going to hear all of the story of Jonah, okay? And, and I love uh, the story of Jonah because I, I had an opportunity to to, to study it in depth in my Hebrew class in seminary. I, I did not love Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew and I were not friends. Uh, my brain did not mesh with learning uh, the Hebrew language. It, it was, I, I just struggled with it. But I loved learning a, a little bit more about, about this story. Um, I, learned, I loved learning about the, the language. Jonah is a, a very simple story in Hebrew compared to a lot of uh, the other books of the Bible. It's very short, but it's, the, the language is simple. It's, it's a story, uh, and, and as you read it and as we talk about it today, it's, it's almost like a, a kid's story. It, it can be funny at times. It was written almost like a, a satire. It's, it's sarcastic at times. You want to go, really, Jonah? Is that how you're going to act? Is, is that what you're going to do? You're going to make that choice? Uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, but a lot of that doesn't make it into our English translation. And so you're going to get the uh, story of Jonah via Will today. I think what I like most about the story of Jonah is, is its sarcastic nature. And, and God speaks to Jonah, and Jonah runs away. And, and Jonah runs, and he gets on a boat. And he's sailing, and he goes to sleep in the bottom of the boat, and, and there's this great storm, and, and the sailors go, well, I know it's not me. Is it your fault that the storm is coming? Well, let's go get this stranger in the bottom of the boat and, and find out who he is. And, and they say, Jonah, who, who are you, and, and where are you from, and, and who's your God, and, and what have you done? Now, mistake number one for Jonah was the fact that he ran from God. Uh, mistake number two was that when folks came and said, who are you and, and where are you from and who's your God and what have you done? He answered them. <laughs> and, and mistake number three uh, was that he said, I, I'm Jonah and I'm from uh, Tarshish and my God is the creator of the universe and, and I ran away from him. And I volunteered to throw myself overboard. And they said, okay, Jonah, that sounds good. See ya. And, and Jonah ends up in the water. And, and what happens to Jonah? But he gets eaten by a giant fish or a whale. And, and there are whales in the Mediterranean. I looked it up on the internet. And everything on the internet is, is true, right? Right? He was swallowed by a really big fish. And, and he was sitting in, in, in the belly of, of this fish, because that's what you do when you get eaten. By a really big fish as you sit in its, in its belly. And, and what do you do when you're in the fish, the belly of a fish? You pray. <laughs> and then you had better pray hard. And God hears Jonah's prayer. And, and a lot of our, uh, our English translation uh, say that, that Jonah was uh, shot out or, or thrown out or spewed out of this whale. He was vomited out. Uh, the, the literal word there in Hebrew is to vomit from the gut, a, a, a deep, nasty, gross. He was thrown up and it was yucky. It's funny, isn't it? <laughs> and, and, and he's sitting there on the beach and he says, I guess I should go to Nineveh now and deliver the message that God gave me to deliver. And I love the, the Veggie Tales version of, of this story because the, the people, uh, the, the horrible, sinful people in Nineveh, they slap each other with fish. I mean, it's, it, it's silly and it kind of fits the, the silliness of the story. And so Jonah, he's, he's on the, the seashore and he's been thrown up by the whale and he goes to Nineveh and Nineveh is a huge city. It would have taken three days to walk from one entrance to the other entrance, all the way across. And, and Jonah, he, he does what God says, kind of, and, and he walks one day's journey. He goes a third of the way into the city, and I imagine that it was something like 
I think God's probably going to destroy you, so you should repent of your sins or get out of the city. And, and left. You know, but if God said, I need you to go and deliver a message to this people, you would probably go to like the town center or maybe where the, you know, the palace was, where everybody was gathered and say, what are you doing? You're going to be destroyed. Get out of here. Turn your life around. I don't think that's what Jonah did. It said that he went a third of the way into the city and delivered his message and that he expected the people to die. But guess what? The people heard the message. I, I don't know how they heard, but word began to spread and the people, they put on sackcloth and they began to repent of their sins. And message got word to the king and, and what did the king do? But he said, everybody needs to wear sackcloth and, and we will repent of our sins and, and we'll turn around for God. And, and not just the king, uh, but, but other folks, the, the, the royal family, you all will wear sackcloth too. And, and the workers and, and the poor, everyone will wear sackcloth, even the animals. Really, king, what do the animals do? Can you see that it's almost a little funny? We're so sinful that we're going to make our animals wear sackcloth. But God saw the heart of the people of Nineveh. And he saw that, that their turning around was authentic and was true. And God said, you know what? I'm not going to destroy you. You're a good people. Insert Jonah temper tantrum. Really, God? I, I knew that you were going to do this. I knew that you were gonna be gracious and loving. I knew that you were gonna take care of these people. How dare you love somebody? How, how dare you do that? I'm, I'm, I'm mad, this is awful. Just, just kill me and get, me over with, get it over with. This is just too much. Really, Jonah, I mean, do you need some attention? We can, we can all focus on Jonah for a minute. Give Jonah his attention. <laughs> And Jonah leaves the city, and, and, and I imagine that he goes up on a hill, and, and he says, you know what, I think these people are a horrible, sinful people, and they're going to die, and God's going to destroy them, and I'm going to sit here and watch. And he builds himself a little shelter. And, and God sends a, a, a plant to grow. And, and this plant uh, grows fast overnight, and it's a, a great uh, leafy plant. Uh, some, some say it may be a, a castor bean plant and they've got big leaves. Uh, other scholars think it's something very similar to a giant cucumber. I like to think of giant cucumber. It fits with my veggie tails. Uh, <laughs> so this giant cucumber plant grows up over the shelter and provides wonderful shade for Jonah for him to just sit on his throne of judgment and wait for the people of Nineveh to be destroyed. Well, the next night, a little worm comes. And this little worm eats the entire plant. No more giant cucumber. No more giant cucumber. And what does Jonah do? Temper tantrum number two. God, this is awful. Just kill me now. I don't have my giant cucumber anymore. I need my shade. I can't, I can't take this. Just, just kill me. And God says to Jonah, do you have any right to be this upset? That something that you didn't work for, you, you didn't plant it, you didn't grow it. Do you have a right to be upset that, that it came in one night and blessed you and and one away in the next day? And, and if you're that upset about a giant cucumber, should I not be as equally or even more concerned about the 120,000 people who live in Nineveh? And it ends. One of the crazy things about the, the story of Jonah is that it just ends. You don't get to see any resolution between God and Jonah or Jonah and the people. It just ends. One of my Bibles has it on uh, two pages right beside each other. And, and you, you turn 
expecting that there to be one more chapter, one more paragraph, and it's not there. But I think that I like that because it allows us to, to think about how that story might have been resolved based on God's response to Jonah. Now, this is not the story that I had uh, in mind originally when I had planned out this sermon series uh, on Disney movies. And I had another passage, but I was watching uh, Cars in, in preparation, and I think one of the reasons why I like this movie series is I get to watch, uh, I get to watch movies and say, yeah, I'm doing research. Um, and, and I was watching Cars, and, and I saw this scene. Uh, it was a scene of, of judgment. It was a scene of, of superiority. And Jonah's attitude as he uh, walked into Nineveh just came onto my heart and wouldn't go away. And I remembered that it was Jonah's pride and his sinful nature that kept him from realizing that, that he was just as broken as the people of Nineveh. And so when I, I saw this clip of, of lightning that we're gonna watch here in a second, I thought of Jonah. Lightning ends up in Radiator Springs, not at the command of God, but by accident. But he shows up with the same judgmental attitude that we hear in the story of Jonah. He thinks that he's better than the folks there. What we see in this movie is that the, the hotshot hot race car driver, Lightning McQueen, who, who likes to work solo, he's fired all of his crew chiefs and all of his support staff discovers that, that he needs a team to journey through this thing called life with him. He, he discovers that it's not a team of, of highly trained racing professionals who, who will get him to where he needs to be, but a bunch of misfit cars from the middle of nowhere. I like Mater because he's goofy. And, and he discovers that having this community around him, belonging to this group, not only helps him to, to achieve his, his racing potential, but it's also the reason that he's able to make the right choice at the end of the movie. And just in case you haven't seen it, I, I won't tell you what his right choice is having this community of misfits to which he belongs is the reason that the lightning is able to live into a higher calling to focus and, and care about something greater than himself. I think the reason that the story of Jonah came into mind while watching this movie is the pain that I have when I hear people who do not know the love of Christ express the, the times that, that they have felt torn down and held down and judged by people proclaiming to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Too often, I think the, the church's ministry and, and, and individual Christian witness has been more like the message of Jonah. Let me ride into town on my white horse of victory, proclaim that, that you are judged and I'm gonna sit back and see what happens. Because I've got it figured out. And you folks here are a bunch of sinners and, and I'm gonna see how God judges you. When in reality, the message of, of God that we, we need to be sharing, that, that folks need to hear, is like the words that that God spoke to Jonah at the end of the story today. If you're so caught up on these little things, if that's what you care about, should I not be even more concerned about all those folks in Nineveh? I, I know you're, you're not perfect. I know they're not perfect, but, but I love them. And we see that through and through in the love that he showed us through his son, Jesus Christ. He, he said, I, I know you're not perfect but I'm gonna love you anyways and I'm gonna love you more than you can even begin to comprehend. Jonah couldn't see that the people of Nineveh 
turned their lives around faster than he turned his life around. The, the word of God came to the people of Nineveh through Jonah, and what did they do? Immediately they threw on sackcloth and began to repent. When the word of God came to Jonah, what did he do? He ran, and he got in a boat, and he tried to sail away. And then he thought, maybe I'll get this over with, and I'll let him throw me in the ocean, and I'll just be dead. But he got swallowed by a whale. Jonah didn't realize that, that he had turned his back on God time and time and time again. And then we showed up to deliver this message that God had given him. He showed up with an attitude of superiority, of I figured this out. And he didn't even do what God told him to do. He went a third of the way into the city. He didn't even go halfway through the city or all the way through the city. Jonah was just as bad off, if not worse off, than the people who he was trying uh, to give warning to. I told you before that I love this story because it seems unfinished. And, and I like to think that that message that God spoke to Jonah at the end of chapter four changed Jonah's life. And that he was able to see that, that his pride was standing in the way of his relationship with God. And, and, and the path would unfold before him that, that he would begin to live for God and with God. And, and then maybe he journeyed down off his soapbox and went and began to build relationships with the people in Nineveh and then began to live as a people of God together. And that Jonah's life and the Jonah's ministry were radically changed by the experience he had with the people of Nineveh. If you think you're not good enough to, to hang out with church people, if you've been hurt at any time by Christians claiming to share the love of God, to you I say you are welcome and I'm sorry. You see, none of us are any better off than the other. One of my favorite passages of scripture is uh, the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, right before the chapter on love and Paul's teaching about spiritual gifts. And, and he says that, that a hand is, is no more important than a foot, eyes no more important than ears or nose, but that everything together makes up the body of Christ. And, and through that, great things are possible. Separately, uh, a hand isn't any good without an arm. And an arm doesn't work too well without a shoulder. And a shoulder needs a torso to be attached. It needs a head and a brain to know where to tell it to move. No part is good on its own. It's just a bunch of misfit pieces of flesh and bone. But together it's able to do great things. You and I fail often when we're apart. But when we remove ourselves, we are empowered to, to join into something greater. When we step outside of who we are, God is able to work in and, and through and, and sometimes in spite of how we live and how we act. Through Jesus Christ and, and the power of, of the Holy Spirit, God is, is calling us in, into a perfect community of misfits, back into a perfect relationship with him. No, how, no matter how many times we mess up or, or how many times we fall short of his grace, he is calling us back into that relationship. Come home, my child, come home. This community not only brings us closer together, but it brings us closer to God. Will you join this community of misfits? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.